Phil Stifle back for a second visit to our show, but his first time getting to talk to you, Bill. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's welcome Phil Stifle to Philly Press Box Radio. Phil, the host of Trending in the AM. We've talked about him a lot of times here on the show. Good, good evening. I, I normally say good morning. So good evening, gentlemen. It's good to be back on the show. Yeah, you keep some yeah. weird hours, man. Uh, Phil, <laughs> hey, let's start here. I don't get to watch your terrific show every morning, but I'm going to guess this has been one of your topics. So here goes. The Eagles are 6-2, and two, but the head coach gets pretty heavily criticized by a big chunk of the fan base. Now, he is far from perfect. We saw some of his miscues on Sunday, but does Nick Sirianni get too much fan criticism? Oh, that's such a tough one because I'm torn on this because I got two per two different opinions on it. Yes, he deserves the criticism because – let me let me backtrack to really why. I, I, I get criticized a lot as a Rob Thompson hater, and I always say the Phillies have had a lot of success the last two years despite Rob Thompson's management, uh -huh. but it seems to work. And, and I don't know. I've been watching baseball for 35, 40 years. I don't know why or how it works. And I kind of feel like the same thing is happening with Nick Sirianni. I know he's 40 and 19 as the Eagles head coach. He's been to the Super Bowl, never missed the playoffs, but yet, there's still a lot of very questionable decisions that he makes on a regular basis. And I kind of feel like it works. And if it works, as long as it continues to work, you got to keep going with it, whether we like it or not, whether he makes us scratch our head or not, you kind of just got to roll with it until, until it stops working at this point. Well, Phil, I think uh, the Eagles are right up there as one of the top, maybe three or four teams in the NFC, I believe. And, uh, I think the Detroit Lions, we could clearly say at this minute, are Absolutely. number one. Uh, Nick Sirianni reminds me a whole lot of Dan Campbell. Uh, they have a whole lot of ego. They trust their players. They make, they put them in positions to make plays. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And with that comes a lot of criticism, and Dan Campbell gets that criticism just as well. Yeah, he does. And, and you know, I, I really truly think that uh, Dan Campbell probably stays out a little bit more of the – play-by-play -play decision making than Nick Sirianni does but you know what you're right I mean it works it seems to work the players love Nick Sirianni you've never heard any player publicly criticize the guy you you literally it's, it's just like it's just like Rob Thompson it just keeps working he, he makes some boneheaded decisions I'm an old school football and sports mind you don't take points off the board obviously that is something that out of all his decisions this past week really frustrated me you just don't do that in my opinion but it still worked it didn't backfire i just think you roll with it but you make sure you have a short leash in the sense of when it stops working you can't wait you got to pull the trigger right away but as long as the team backs them up don't worry about the fans don't worry about the media as long as the team's winning that's all that really matters what should we make of Jalen Hurts? They are winning now with him. Four in a row, as Ruben Frank pointed out, four straight games of a passer rating of 119 or above. First time any Eagles quarterback has done that, apparently. Uh, is he more of a game manager now? Does that matter? I mean, the wins matter, right? I, the wins matter. I, I think Jalen Hurts is a little bit more than a game manager. The thing with Jalen Hurts, first and foremost, is he's had, what, like 75 different offensive coordinators in the <laughs> last four years. I, I think you had to give him a little time this year to adjust to at least all his other coordinators. They kind of were similar to an extent. Kellen Moore is completely different than anything he's ever had to, you know, work with. So you had to definitely give Jalen Hurts a little time to adjust. But the thing with Jalen Hurts, he's not a game manager. I, don't, I, I struggle to put this into words all the time when I'm talking about it on my show, and that's you need to get Jalen Hurts going. You got to get him in a rhythm, short passes. Running plays early. I know Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman, they like the big explosive plays. They like to work backwards, pass to set up the run. But the problem is that doesn't work for Jalen Hurts. If you notice the last game or two when he's really starting to settle in, you're seeing longer drives with handoffs to Saquon Barkley, under center. You're seeing slants to Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown. Easy things to build that confidence up. And then you see those big explosive plays, the big touchdown pass to Saquon Barkley, the even more amazing catch from Devontae Smith this past week. You build him up, and then once he gets that momentum and confidence going, he's not a game manager anymore. So he's a game manager to start, but once he's feeling it, I think he's perfectly fine with whatever kind of offense you want to run. Well, Phil, I back to, to Hertz and Sirianni together. I, I'd like to have been in the meetings during the bye week because Absolutely. apparently they had some 
real good offensive meetings that everybody was involved. And to their credit, they've changed the offense. Now, the schedule was in their favor for these last four games. All very nice wins, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've adjusted. They've become a run-first team that we've been looking for for years. Now we got it. Uh, it's taken the pressure off of Hertz to allow him to play better. Uh, he's not in a pressure situation all the time to make plays. And I think what we're seeing is him playing more back to that 2022 mm -hmm. uh, time frame than what, certainly what we saw last year. You know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, this is, it, I love that you bring up the bye week because I know I saw on social media and in the media in general some negative come out of the bye week because you heard Lane Johnson speak up about how he and a couple of players went to Nick Siri and said, hey, this is what we see on the field. This is what we think would work. To me, that tells me how great of a coach Nick Sirianni really can be, that he has built a locker room and a culture where he has that open-door policy where, where team, the, not just the leaders, anybody on the team can go to him and be like, yeah, look, coach, this is what I'm seeing out there. Can we try something else? And the fact that not only has the open-door policy, that Nick Sirianni trusts his players and his leaders to make those kind of suggestions, I think it's fantastic. And it didn't cause a rift. If anything, it kind of maybe brings the team closer together because then the leaders have the back of the coach and the coach has the back of the leaders and it all works in synchronization. Look, he still makes those head-scratching decisions, but, you know, if you've got that great culture, culture matters so much in sports, then you can get by. Hey, I want to ask you something about Saquon Barkley, Phil, but before I do that, I want to play Merrill and Mike's call of that amazing Barkley <laughs> catch and backwards hurdle on Sunday. So here's that. Hurts in the gun. He backpedals. He's looking, still looking. He fires it out in the flat to Barkley, who beats one man, spins past another, leaps over a third, what was and that? comes down at the 30. What was that? <laughs> I've never seen that move, and I've been watching football all my life. Well, he did that. Listen, he no, did no. that to show off to Shady McCoy. He's never done this. No one's ever done this. He hurdles a guy backwards. How do you jump over a guy backwards? He did. <laughs> I think we've all watched that play about 30 times this week. <laughs> I haven't listened to the Merrill Reese call on it yet. That was the first time I heard him yeah. and Mike Quick do it. That's. Yeah, it's I figured some people right hadn't there. heard it, so that's why I put it in there. I uh, made a little slideshow. Uh, my question, though, Saquon Barkley on pace right now for 371 touches this season. That's a lot. Is that too much? Should they, you know, tone it down a bit? You know, it's funny you say that because I did talk the last couple days on my show about leading up to the trade deadline where a sneaky target for me would have been another running back because, you know, you are running Saquon Barkley a lot. He it was it. Against Jacksonville, I think he touched the ball 31 of the 70 offensive plays. That's a lot. You know, he's definitely touching the ball a lot. But the offense runs through him. So you have to have, if you don't want him running the ball 25 times a game, plus catching the ball in the backfield, you kind of have to, you know, go out and get somebody else that could do the exact same thing. You know, I'd like to see them bring somebody else in. I'd like to see them have trust in maybe Kenny Gainwell occasionally. It can't hurt to give Will Shipley a snap or two behind, yeah. you know, Jalen Hurts there. You've got the bodies there. They just don't do it yet. Um, I am concerned about wearing him out come, come the end of the season. And if you think back to 2017, what did Howie Roseman do at the trade deadline in 2017? He went out and got J.H.I. to add to LeGarrette Blunt so that LeGarrette Blunt, who was in the later part of his career, didn't get burned out. Then you had that one-two punch. Now there's guys that are free agents. I don't know if they'll add anybody else or not. But it's it's something that I'm monitoring, especially you know going up a, this week against Dallas. Dallas gives up 147 yards per game on the ground, which means it's a team you can run against heavily and often right now. Which means they're going to have a game plan of running the ball again this week. And then you got the short week against Washington. You got you got to be careful there with Saquon Barkley for sure, and that's why he did not practice today. He was given uh, you know the day of rest today. Yep. Yeah. Well, buried in this Saquon Barkley stuff and Jalen Hurt stuff is the play of the defense. And uh, Zach Bond comes off of a scrap heap in New Orleans to, and he's playing Pro Bowl level ball. We got uh, Kobe Dean. All of a sudden, he's playing like a pro, and we got two rookie defensive backs that are locking it down. Uh, a lot of credit needs to be going to what's going on over on that side of the ball. Absolutely. I mean, 
Is it a coincidence that the Eagles are undefeated since Cooper DeGene's been starting? I don't know. Maybe. You know, <laughs> there's a good chance about that. No, I mean, Vic Fangio, I knew it coming in. It was going to take a while. For a bunch of guys that have been playing one style, it was going to take a little while for them to learn truly what Vic Fangio wanted out of each and every person. You see N'Kobe Dean starting to trend upward. You're seeing Nolan Smith finally breaking out of his shell. Obviously, the rookie cornerbacks are playing fantastic right now. Um, it, it took some time. Um, I have one concern, just like because you mentioned Saquon Barkley and his amount of times he's touching the football. Jalen Carter's playing north of 90% of the snaps yeah. every single week on defense now, and that does concern me quite a bit um, because he is a defense tackle. He's a larger man. You know, Fletcher Cox in his height was playing 70 75% of the snaps. So Jalen Carter playing the amount he does does concern me a little bit, but for the most part, this defense has been locked down perfect. And We'll see how they look in a couple of weeks when we face Washington. You know, that'll be their first real test. But I'm really, really overly – I'm more confident, honestly, in the defense than I am the offense at this point. That's how excited I am about them. Well, Phil, we're going to switch to basketball in a second. But what is your midweek prediction for the Eagles-Cowboys game? Birds favored by 7 to 7.5 right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Eagles win. Um, uh, there, there's, there's not much in my mind without Dak Prescott playing. CeeDee Lamb practiced limitedly today and, you know – Micah Parsons says he's going to play. He hasn't practiced yet, but it's Eagles. It's Dallas. It's in Dallas. It's going to be a close game. I would never in my life, I'm a better. Some people call me a degenerate. I would never bet an Eagles Cowboys game, no matter what the line was. I just, you just don't bet Eagles versus Cowboys. You stay away from that. Uh, but I do have the confidence in this team to get the win. I will say some people are calling it a trap game with Washington on yeah. Thursday night, the next week. Sometimes there could be that letdown. And all I say is no Eagles player ever has a letdown Dallas week. It just doesn't happen. So they're going to go in there. They're going to win. I expect it to be a close game again, but I think the Eagles go in there and get the W this week. Let me switch it over to Hoops. Joel Embiid, I know you talked about that whole situation on your show. I caught some of it in recent days. Uh, for people who haven't seen or heard, what have you been saying about Joel Embiid and how it all went down with Marcus Hayes and Embiid still ramping up and now suspended for three games? Sum it up for us, Phil. Well, first and foremost, with the Marcus Hayes situation, I think there's a lot of things wrong with this situation. First and foremost, the article, you know, the clickbait. I used to respect and listen to and read Marcus Hayes when I was growing up a lot. Uh, listen to him always on Daily News Live when they used to have that show. You know, always had a problem. But he, just like a lot of other media members, have fallen into the clickbait material and, and whatnot. And when you bring someone's deceased brother into a conversation, their son, to question their, you know, dedication to the sport. Like, I, I got a lot of family stuff in my life. And... If anybody ever talks negatively or despairingly about my family, you know, I might get a little bit worse off than a little shoving with the person that was involved in it. I'll just say that um, it was wrong. But I think the Sixers were wrong in the situation as well because they knew this was happening. In my opinion, why did the Sixers let Marcus Hayes so close to the situation happening into that locker room after a game while Joel Embiid's trying to ramp up? To me, I think the Sixers organization let this whole situation get out of hand. Um, that's just my opinion on it. Um, I think they could have done a little bit better. I think Joel Embiid will be back. What is it? Next week against the Knicks is when his suspension's up. I think he's been ramped up. I think he will play. Um, he will be playing limited amount of games and, out, and minutes and all, but it is what it is. I really, I really truly think that the Sixers let this whole situation get out of hand. Yeah, and, and if what you've read is, is right, uh, they immediately – uh, placed the blame on Embiid, called Marcus Haynes in and and uh, apologized to him. Uh, that's not that's not a good look. But but let me take it one step further with you, Phil. Uh, Sixer fans, and I don't know if you see this on your show, are really really down on Embiid, and I, I'm mm -hmm. probably one of them, uh, just because of the history. Um, nobody really feeling too sorry for him about this whole thing. Can Embiid come back from this? With the fans, I mean, he yeah. you know he's going to get on the court and score 30 or 35 points. He's that good of a player. But what's it going to take for him to win this fan base back? I mean, it's going to take winning games in the playoffs. I don't think the fans are going to care if he plays 35, 40 games. Don't care. I think he's going to have to go out there and perform at a healthy level in the playoffs. And that's all it's going to be. Otherwise, it's just going to be another situation of what if 20 years from now, looking back on this, what if Joel Embiid stayed healthy? What if, you know, you know, somebody brought up Allen Iverson and all the, the issues. People, a lot, a lot of the younger crowd forget how many issues Allen Iverson had with Larry Brown, 
and with the fans. And if there's social media back in that era, Allen Iverson might have been remembered a little differently as well. Um, but Allen Iverson overcame that, won an MVP, got to the NBA Finals and whatnot, and that changed the narrative. There was a point, if I, I forget what year it was, that there was a put up or shut up with the organization and Allen Iverson, we're going to trade you, or he was going to ask for a trade or else. You know what I mean? So this is a very eerily similar situation. Just Allen Iverson didn't sit out as many games. He played hurt, et cetera. But right. outside of the run to the championship against the Lakers, he really never had that playoff success. It's going to take Joel Embiid to be healthy in the playoffs. Whatever it takes. Whatever it yeah. takes to get healthy in the playoffs, that's all that matters. And then he's going to have to go put up in the playoffs. And as we said, he'll probably be back next Tuesday when the Sixers play the Knicks in the first NBA Cup battle, that all-important <laughs> NBA Cup. I that's, been the whole, that's my joke today. The whole oh. entire thing with Joel Embiid was to protect him so he's back in time for the NBA Cup because they want the Sixers to win the NBA Cup. That that it was all a setup and you know whatnot yeah. from the league to get Joel there for that. I did catch you a little bit of your show today, and I saw you talking about that. All right, Phillies briefly. Will they yeah. go after Juan Soto? They will at least a bit. How seriously will they go after Juan Soto? And what are, what other moves might the Phillies make this offseason? Well, I think the Phillies are going to shock their fans with more moves than people realize. I've already heard rumors about Brandon Marsh, Alec Bohm, and a couple other names that might get moved on. They didn't want to make any changes to their coaching staff, which I was shocked whether you like Rob Thompson or not, whether it was Kevin Long, something had to change in the organization. They chose not to make the change with the coaches. And if you really listen to Dave Dombrowski's tone and his words in his postseason press conference, they kind of put the blame on the players for not succeeding in the playoffs. Um, so that tells me that he is going to make some big changes. Uh, whether it's Alec Bohm. I, I saw somebody today, one of the reporters out there, writing that maybe Nick Castellanos is on the trade block. Um, a, a very popular, liked Phillies player is going to go in this offseason. Who it is, I do not know. Will they go after Juan Soto? They are going to try. That's the only reason why you keep Kevin Long, because of his relationship yeah. from Washington with Juan Soto. They have a very close relationship. Um, I just don't know. You guys are a little bit older, not trying to say anything. Happy birthday, Jim. Yeah. Um, Chet, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know if you can win with that many 500 and 300 million dollar players and no homegrown talent if you get rid of all these young players to bring on Juan Soto. Yeah, what, what did you think about uh, Hoffman becoming a free agent? They're they're basically going to let him walk. I mean, he obviously he struggled in the last series there, uh, but he was rock solid all season and for the last two seasons. And it appears they're going to let him walk. They don't want to pay him. I think they're going to try to make an effort to re-sign him. Um, I saw, I forget who it was, somebody on ESPN that does, like, salary, uh, ex like, they, they predict what a player's going to sign in free agency. Uh, he's projected to be signed for more than Carlos Estevez, who is also a free agent. Yeah. I think they will try to bring back Jeff Hoffman. I do think they like Orion Kirkring, and I think that they the goal is ultimately to make him, the, not next year, but in the future, the closer of this team. So if they have to give Jeff Hoffman a three- or four-year deal, maybe they let him walk. Look, something's got to change. The team yeah. collapsed in the playoffs. The bullpen was solid until the playoffs. Something's got to give. You, you can't give Jeff Hoffman $48 million and then Juan Soto 500 and then fill out the, the – half the bullpen is in free agency this year. So there's a lot of work that needs done. You have to be picky and choosy, no matter how much money John Middleton is willing to spend. Yeah, and, and I saw where Hoffman makes like two point two million, and uh, they're expecting him to sign upward to ten. So obviously that plays into it. Yeah, absolutely plays into it. Look, I liked Hoffman. I thought Hoffman was a fantastic story. And you know what? I would, you know, people get upset when free agents sign for big money and leave their team. Jeff Hoffman, I forget the exact number, but I remember when he first got hot this year. People were talking about he has played on like nine different teams. He's been sent down to the minors thirty different times. This was his crowning moment. This is his chance to get his first big payday ever um, and set his family up. So he is going to go out there, and you hate to see a guy go for the money versus the team or the championship, but this is Hoffman's one chance to go for the money. So he is going to go for the money. So if somebody outbids the Phillies, he'll probably go where the money is at this point. And yeah, that's like not a knock work. on Hoffman at all, just so all you know. All right, Phil, before I, we let you uh, go and make a big pitch for trending in the AM also, i got to mention this. Bill, when I had Phil on a few months ago, a night that you were off, we talked about the fact that Phil owns a pizza shop, and I talked about the fact that my favorite topping is pepperoni pizza, okay? I love a good pepperoni pizza. There it is. 
foxes and Phil oh, dissed ready me. Repair. He dissed me for liking pepperoni. He said it's like too commonplace. I have to go something more exotic or whatever. Oh, uh, Phil, nah. It's the oh. most overrated pizza topping in the world. <laughs> it, on, it really man. is. I mean, I sell more pepperoni pizza than anything else, but it is so overrated. There are so many better toppings than pepperoni <laughs> on a pizza. So well, many. The, the only thing I could go for is more meat. I can always go oh, yeah. for more meat. but I, I just uh, don't like a plain pepperoni pizza. To me, that's just too boring. I like bacon on my pizza, Italian sausage. Yellow banana peppers, red onions, oh, loaded I, up I, with all different combos like that. But I just had a pepperoni, pepperoni pizza since yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Phil, plug away. Tell us again yeah. about trending in the AM and why people should be watching it. Trending yeah, in the right, AM every every Monday through Friday, eight AM to nine thirty, except for tomorrow. Um, got to take the, the morning off tomorrow. But every Monday through Friday, eight AM to nine thirty, right on the STT Sports Network. I have two goals, okay, with trending in the AM and this network. I want to set the trends for what sports networks should be and trending in the AM. I've created it to make sure that your opinions actually matter. It's not about my opinions on any topic. Trending in the AM is about your opinions. I set the topics. We talk movies, sports, m beer, anything, whatever you want to talk about, whatever your opinion is. I, I, I fear that in this yeah. day and age and social media and everything else, that your opinions don't care and everyone bashes you for your opinion. So as long as you do it in a productive way, literally every single opinion is welcomed on the show. And I will discuss it with you. I won't always agree, but I will discuss it in an engaging way versus the hateful way that what you see everywhere else on in the media and in social media and stuff. There you go. I told you, Bill. Good All stuff. Right.